the bite of 83 is done. Back when FNAF 4 released, the consensus was that the Night 5 minigame was the often alluded to and theorized bite of 87. Was that the bite of 87? Which would indeed place FNAF 4 in the year of 1987. The teaser images support this too, with Was It Me? and other disturbing messages accompanying the nightmarish reincarnation of the classic Freddy's cast, not to mention 8s and 7s found within the game's source code. In fact, back in FNAF 1, if you go into the custom night mode and set the robots to 1987, you will be greeted to a jump scare by Golden Freddy which is what Fredbear is clearly supposed to be. Everything lines up except for one key detail. The television in the child's home shows a cartoon Fredbear and Friends, and there's a date, 1983. And unless this is a rerun of a Fredbear TV show earlier in the decade, this heavily, heavily implies that the events of FNAF 4 is set during the year 1983. Okay. But let's, look, but let's let's look at some other clues. Fazbear is clearly in his prime. There's merchandise, TV shows, and likely two sister locations open at once, Freddy Fazbear's and Fredbear's. So I doubt this is a rerun. So everything looks like this is actually set in 1983. Hmm. Also consider that Matt Pat back in 2015 did produce an upload of an F4 Fury video centered around the bite of 87 and how these nightmarish visions are ultimately impossible without a frontal lobe. Which is true. And Scott seems to imply in this comment from years ago that Mappa is missing a crucial detail, further implying 1983. No, I was wrong in calling this the bite of 87. I'm man enough to admit my mistakes. Hey, it's why they're called theories after all, right? Anyway, in this case, Scott was sure to let me know my error in his first comment on any of my videos on the franchise to my knowledge. Pretty sure everyone agrees nowadays that this event is the bite of 83 or chomp of 83 or perhaps the spring lock incident mentioned in FNAF 3's phone calls. Uh, there's been a slight change of company policy concerning the use of the suit. Um, don't. After learning of an unfortunate incident at the sister location involving multiple and simultaneous spring lock failures, the company has deemed the suit temporarily unfit for employees. Makes sense, right? So what's the problem? Uh, Scott deliberately misled fans, setting up clues, or circling to this event being the, no the bite of 83, and then suddenly throws a curveball, making all of these clues entirely and completely redundant. And it also opens up a plot hole. Why isn't why wasn't a bite of 83 ever mentioned? Sure, you could say that this is the spring lock incident, but it's clearly a bite. Also consider that the bite of 87 is the only pivotal moment in the entire timeline we have not explicitly seen in either a minigame or the game's core cutscene and gameplay itself. It's not being smart. It's just been deliberately obtuse to throw us off. It's completely dumb. This should have been the bite of 87. I will point out though, there is of course the infamous Dream Fury, which was just a cheap and lazy attempt at bookending the series. Sure, you can see on face value that Dream Fury might work, but it doesn't. You wanna know why? How can a child know the explicit, accurate minimum wage of 1993? What the hell are the other minigames supposed to be then if it's all a dream? Remember FNAF 3's perfect climactic and emotional ending? It's all invalidated by the Dream Fury. I know Dream Fury isn't canon anymore, but I still want to point out that it's dumb and it doesn't really work. Even if it looks like it might, but it doesn't. Lastly, Dream Fury doesn't work for another pivotal reason. Like Matt Pat says, a child missing his frontal lobe would not be able to have these forms of nightmares. Oh yeah, so Dream Fury literally doesn't work anyways, but anyway. I also want to point out, Scott implies FNAF 4 isn't the Bite of 87, before suddenly shoving Dream Fury in our face before eventually definitively canonizing the 1983 day after a major backlash. We can see in FNAF sister location in the Night 5 secret ending office. If you type in 1983 on the keypad, this will give you security footage of the FNAF 4 house. Accompany that with Scott's message about a time when he did retcon something in his story and made sure to clarify this in his next game, 
Quote, the truth is that I've done one actual retcon in the series, although I'm not going to say where it was. There have been other times, however, when my original intentions didn't come across clearly. In those instances, I make a point to clarify in the next game. I use the sister location to clear up a misconception from FNAF 4. End quote. Reading this, the obvious misconception from FNAF 4 was the year the events in the game took place, which, true to his word, he clarified via sister location and the private room camera code of 1983. 1984. Three. And sister location is the sequel to FNAF 4. Point being, Scott Colvin didn't know what to do with FNAF 4 at all. He was all over the place, constantly changing his mind about the story, and deliberately misleading fans with evidence that ultimately meant nothing. He seemed to be setting up the game to be about the bite of 87, but then he heavily implies that it has nothing to do with that and, and it has something to do with the bite of 83, but then he suddenly shoves in Dream Fury and screws up everything and then after a backlash he just tries to retcon everything just to keep going, I, I guess. Oh, and then there's the box that literally meant nothing at all. Good job. This just reeks of a storyteller with a lack of confidence in his own story. No wonder he decided to have his book series set in an alternate timeline, which I think was definitely for the better. Anyways, back to FNAF 4. The sad part is, it didn't need to be like this either. There is an easy way to make FNAF 4's story fit cleanly into the pre-existing timeline without retconning anything. Here is the solution. FNAF 4 is set in 1987, around the same time as FNAF 2, maybe before, same year, whatever. In the height of Fazbear Entertainment's popularity, hell, this would explain why there's a toy line of the toy robots. You know, because it's the same year as FNAF 2. From here, most of the game and pre-existing clues can stay the same. Of course, replace the TV date with 1987, obviously. But here is my explanation for the nights. They're actually set at the same time as the days leading up to the birthday party. Wait, let me clarify. The days leading up to the birthday party seen in FNAF 4, the nights we witness are his actual nightmares. In those nights leading up to the birthday party in that week, I hope that made sense. This part was unscripted because I needed to clarify that better, but anyway. And the nightmarish animatronics are actually subconscious depictions of the brother and his friends. And of course, when Crying Child is bitten by Fredbear, his dreams are swarmed by a nightmarish apparition of Fredbear. But what if the Crying Child does not die in the end of FNAF 4? What if the reason why his imaginary friends fade away and he seemingly fades or whatever is because it's the doctors medically removing his frontal lobe. Consider this, the bite crushed his head. It seems that it would cause a lot of internal damage. What if the crying child whilst in hospital, aka not 6 and 7, is experiencing extreme seizures due to extreme brain damage, resulting in the doctors having no choice but to lobotomize him, leading to the child's imagination perishing, but he's still alive. Yes, I think this would actually work a lot. It wouldn't retcon anything and it would make FNAF 4's story more linear, linear and coherent. I do think FNAF 4 should have gone for this approach. It also solves how a kid with no frontal lobe is able to have these nightmares. He couldn't. The nightmares happened before his frontal lobe is removed. I also think the minigame house and the night house should mirror each other more closely to make this more clear. Personally, I'm also aware of Custom Night, but I'm willing to discard that as non-canon, similar to the Halloween update. Doesn't really even work with this. Just consider it as a fun bonus. I imagine Nightmare is the last nightmarish vision the child will ever experience again. Minor clarifications I want to make as well, so this makes more sense. In this alternate take of an Apple story, this isn't a theory, just to say, remember, this is just an idea of what I wish the story did instead. The missing children's incident would have occurred years prior, at the location before the reopening of FNAF 2, and psychic friend Fredbear can be explained either as the crying child's imagination, which I think makes more thematic sense, or alternatively, it's the spirit of Golden Freddy communicating with him. Also, if the missing children's incident occurred years prior to FNAF 4, it would explain the other kids' strange urban legends they pass on. Hell, like MatPat 
theorized once. What if the reason the crying child is scared of the yellow suits is because he saw the missing children's incident? What if he saw the employee dressed up as a yellow animatronic luring the children away? Yes, this would mean that the missing children's incident would happen before the yellow suits are retired and before the kid gets bitten, but it's a theory that works for a lot of different reasons. First, he's always at the pizzerias, especially towards the end of the day, so he'd definitely be in a position to see something like this. Second, it explains his irrational fear of the yellow suits because he saw people get taken to the back and never return. Third, the lines of remember what you saw and you know what will happen if he catches you that psychic friend Fred Bear keeps repeating makes a whole lot more sense now. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, look at this line. These are my friends. If this were indeed true, this line takes on a whole new meaning. I always thought that line was weird. Like, what, they're your imaginary friends? I suppose. But then why would his collection of plushies just be with him when he dies? Why is that such an important detail that Scott chose to include? It would be, really. But what if they were literally his friends? That he knew the kids who went missing and got stuffed. And the plushies being there in the final scene represented not his plushies, but the spirit of his friends. The ones possessing the suits being there with him as he dies. Now that gives you a reason to be scared of this restaurant. Also, yes, I know this would retcon William Afton supposedly spying on his son during FNAF 4, but I think that's really stupid and dumb anyways. All you need to do is change the keypad number to 1987 and remove the Fredbear plush next to a walkie-talkie. Simple as that, and you have a much more streamlined, simple, linear, yet effective horror story that explains the most terrifying event in the FNAF timeline. It's literally that easy to fix. I'm gonna clarify some other things as well. How could the Springlock suits exist in 1987? Because I know some people are gonna say this. Especially when we can see this mantled and slumped over Golden Freddy in FNAF 2. I do have an explanation, but I will admit it is very contrived. So bear with me, and I'm not even really convinced of this idea either, but I'm just gonna present it anyways. FNAF Falls events occur in the early summer of 1987. The Bite of 87 is actually the spring lock incident mentioned in FNAF 3. After learning of an unfortunate incident at the sister location, but it's multiple clearly a bite. spring lock failures, the company has deemed the suit temporarily unfit for employees. Remember that Fredbears is a sister location to Freddy's, and when the FNAF 3 phone calls mention that the Spring Barney animatronic has been noticeably moved or whatever, management has also been made aware that the Spring Barney animatronic has been noticeably moved. This leads eerily perfectly into the second missing children's incident that occurs in FNAF 2. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. Now none of them are acting right. Yes, this would mean the phone guy would have been making the phone calls for FNAF 2 and 3 kind of at the same time. But there isn't really much of a plot hole you could go with that. He's always been some sort of manager type figure. He's the man who teaches and instructs employees what to do. You know, night guards, operating spring locks, whatever. He knows the ins and outs of the company, but he's not at the very top. We can also gather he only works at Freddy Fazbear's, not Fredbear's as well, which my idea is Fredbear is clearly the selling point, the most successful character. So in Freddy Fazbear's, sometimes they will roll out Fredbear and Spring Barney out at special events, because we know the Springlock animatronics are not only at Fredbear's, but also Freddy Fazbear's. So in this theory or idea, they would be in the FNAF 2 location. But usually, it's just the normal cast performing. But, you know, they roll out, they roll out Fredbear and Spring Barney on special occasions, you know? Like birthday parties or whatever, or randomly, you know? This would also mean FNAF 2's location must have a safe room where they are stored. Because this idea says that the phone calls we hear in FNAF 3 are actually from the FNAF 2 location instead. I know, kind of a radical change. The phone calls in FNAF 2 are pre-recorded in the summer. Uh, hello? Hello, hello? Uh, hello and welcome to your new summer job at the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. However, the actual games events are set in November. So what if 
the events of FNAF 4 happened that 1987 summer, this wouldn't wreck on the phone calls and it would explain why the spring lump soups are ultimately retired before the actual events of FNAF 2, which is why Golden Freddy is slumped over and lifeless. Everybody got that? Good! Fred Bear is dead and buried after the bite of 87, completely tarnishing the already controversial brand and with a second missing children's incident happening pretty much at the same time, a crime that also involves Spring Barney, it's no surprise that the Springlock animatronics are ultimately scrapped. The FNAF 2 location clearly attempts to reopen in the winter of that year, but the place is ultimately shut down with the intention to reopen in a much smaller restaurant and also discontinuing the toy robots. I imagine this was done due to heavy lawsuits, the backlash and trying to save as much money as possible. Not to mention rebranding of course since now Freddy would be taking center stage opposed to Fredbear. Leading into the crappy and rundown restaurant in FNAF 1 that reuses the outdated and still possessed Wither animatronics from years prior. Just a bit refurbished and also I'm guessing the spring lock suits were also brought into the FNAF 1 location since we clearly see Golden Freddy as Spring Barney there but I don't know. I imagine they were kept solely for parts and sealed up in or just sealed up in the safe room forever. Also consider the Shadow Freddy could just be Afton wearing the Golden Freddy Springlock suit, maybe. I don't know, I'm not gonna delve too much into this, I'm already rambling too much. In general, I think it does work and is certainly less confusing than the Bite of 83 and Dream Fury explanations. It is not perfect though, and there's probably a ton of holes you can poke into. And yes, FNAF 2's phone calls are pre-recorded. Pre-recorded in the summer. So the birthday party that the phone guy mentions in FNAF 6, no, in Night 6. Uh, we have one more event scheduled for tomorrow, a birthday. You'll be on day shift. Wear your uniform. Stay close to the animatronics and make sure they don't hurt anyone, okay? is not for Jeremy Fitzgerald because he's working in November and listening to phone calls from the month from months prior. So Jeremy probably isn't the actual bite victim in the actual canon. The purple man is stupid. I want you to consider this now, dear viewers. Michael Afton, the son of William Afton, supposedly is believed to be the main protagonist of an Sis location. I mean, it's pretty much obvious. We see Michael Afton become scooped by the fun times, resulting in a Terminator with purple, black, and white eyes. And throughout the FNAF sister location, custom night mini games, we can clearly see an ordinary man, well, Michael, with a purple shirt, slowly but surely becoming more and more decayed. His skin turns purple, he becomes crippled and skinny, his eyes are permanently that same artificial black, white, and purple color. Until the fun times eject ship when they realize they're being noticed, they escape into the sewers and somehow Michael is still alive. Right, fine. Look at the clues given to us throughout Sister Location and really think about We are explicitly shown the origin story of the purple guy. Another crucial event shown in a minigame and literal in-game cutscenes. And hey, the FNAF Uris have been saying for a long time that Michael is supposedly going from restaurant to restaurant undoing his father's work. Tampering and destroying animatronics to free the souls within and using multiple aliases. So consider this, we never see the actual Purple Guy sprite ever explicitly kill. You want to know what we do see him do though? We see Purple Guy as a night guard, like Michael is believed to be. We see Purple Guy destroying and tampering with animatronics, you know, to free them. And consider this too, in FNAF 3's minigames, we see Purple Guy destroying the animatronics to free the souls. But of course they scare him into the Spring Barney suit. And he becomes spring trap. So does this mean Mike Trap is canon? Think about it. We never see Spring Trap in FNAF 3 kill either, weirdly enough. He has the most lackluster jump scare. Okay, not a good point, but 
I also get the feeling Springtrap suit is actually in suit mode, which is why he's forced to go where he hears Bloom Boys, like a programming to go to kids. It's in the animatronics programming, I guess, and Michael is actively fighting against it. We already know Michael can survive fatal damage as well due to Enug and all that crap. And lastly, there's the Sister Location Custom Night final minigame, that's a mouthful, where we can hear Michael calling out to his father in the burnt out Fazbear flights. Father, it's me, Michael. I did it. I found it. It was right where you said it would be. They were all there. They didn't recognize me at first, but then they thought I was you. <laughs> and I found her. I put her back together, just like you asked me to. She's free now, but something is wrong with me. I should be dead, but I'm not. I've been living in shadows. There is only one thing left for me to do now. I'm going to come find you. I'm going to come find you. And Michael even has a robotically sounding voice. I think we have a match. Mike Trap is canon. It makes 100% sense. But why would Michael be laughing at the spirits before becoming Springtrap? Consider the fact that he's working with his father. He was instructed to go to the facility in sister location by his father, by William Afton, or just Mr. Afton in the game's canon. Yeah, he's never actually called William Afton in the game's canon as far as I know. Michael is clearly, clearly working with him. Perhaps feeling guilty after causing his younger brother to lose his frontal lobe or just killing him, whatever. Point is, Michael is clearly on his father's side. He was instructed to go to sister location. Everything he's doing could easily be interpreted as William's work as well. He is instructing him to go from restaurant to restaurant. I mean, the whole idea that he's undoing his father's work was just added on and not really backed up with evidence. Point is, this actually does work. Why is Afton instructing Michael? Either Afton wishes Michael to free his victims out of guilt and he's too cowardly to do it himself, and I guess that could be a good explanation maybe. He's guilt tripping and manipulating Michael into carrying out his nefarious goals, and we can still see hints of Michael's own nefarious nature when he laughs at the soul similar to when he was laughing at his brother, but that's kind of a stretch. But ignoring that, everything actually works somewhat. And yes, I know what you're gonna say. What about FNAF 2's minigame where a purple guy well clearly um I am dead, not a big surprise. Yeah, and we see him smiling manically at Foxy before um, he finds five victims. Well, look at the sprite. It's different, a different color. There's no white eyes either, and he has a completely different physical appearance. This is the only sprite we ever see kill. So yes, Pink Guy. Pink Guy is Mr. Afton, the murderer and co-founder of Hasbro Entertainment alongside his best old buddy, Henry. And Michael, the son, is the purple guy. He's manipulated by Afton to carry out goals and eventually becomes Springtrap. It adds up perfectly. I mean, it actually does add up quite well. Like, all the clues actually do lead to that being the case. I mean, we have a literal entire game showing purple guy's origin story and all the clues match to this. It's a... Yeah, it works. You may not recognize me at first, but I assure you, that's still me. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole, so don't keep the devil waiting, friend. Oh wait, never mind, Pizzeria Sim canonizes Mr. Afton the Springtrap in a desperate attempt to bookend the story, which basically means there's misleading clues now. Oh sure, now the only time we ever see Purple Guy's origin story doesn't actually matter. So, all of these sprites are Afton, are William Afton, but this one isn't. 
Th this one time when we see an actual origin story and an actual... It's not him though. Are, are you, are you, are you, are you real, are you for real? Are you for real? I'm sorry, but there's no way around this. I don't care if Michael supposedly looks similar to his father. This is a terrible story decision. Not only does Scrap Trap or Crap Trap look hideous, a peanut head man, but it's completely throws away a great mystery. All the clues were there. It made sense. It was coherent. This is complete BS and by far the worst narrative decision this series has ever taken. Okay, that's a bit of a stretch, but you get the point. Pizzeria Simulator was just so desperate to bookend the series that it had to spoil a well put together mystery similar to FNAF 4, right? What's even the point of trying to bookend the series if you're just going to keep stretching out the narrative anyways? Help Wanted and Security Breach. What's the solution then? Make Mike Trap Cannon. Simple as that. Midnight Motorist is too obtuse. Lastly, I wanted to go over how ridiculous Midnight Motorist is. Why is there an orange man? Why? When he's in a purple car? My immediate assumption was that this was instead Henry, since the game does involve him a lot. Yeah, why is he riding a purple car? Like the one we see Mr. Afton riding in a FNAF 2 minigame. Not to mention introducing a whole new restaurant, Junior's which likely has some significant lore relevance. Maybe. It doesn't. Also, the house in Midnight Motorist, this old looking bold grandma character watching TV, which given the TV and a similar clothing to the brother in FNAF 4, most assume to be Michael, I guess. But then why is he bold? This can't be after he got scooped, he has hair before he became purple. He had hair before he became purple, so it's not Michael. And who had a rough day? If we go back to the house, we see a smashed window, bunny footprints, and text implying he's gone to that place again. Right, so we can't be playing as Afton, cause the bunny footprints imply this is Mr. Afton. Dressed as Spring Barney luring child outside to the Junior's restaurant, maybe? Which could be the FNAF 2 restaurant or whatever, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. This is all just two up twos, and there's no reasonable explanation to this day. Why have the Sith game center around ending the story once and for all, when you're just gonna throw this in and it adds literally nothing? It connects to nothing meaningful, and it's never followed up on. It doesn't need to be here. Not to mention the burial, which means nothing. It's just all over the place. There's small hints that it might connect to something, but it just doesn't add up at all. There's no reasonable explanation. The only idea I have is that this is supposed to be symbolic, and the orange man is supposed to be Afton's father, who's a, a bit of an abusive guy, and the kid running away with the bunny footprints is meant to uh, symbolize his path into becoming Spring Barney and, and the burial. I, no, it's just dumb. This is dumb. It means it connects to nothing. The worst part is that it's entirely unnecessary. FNAF's story can be so much simpler and satisfying easily. I want to point out something, just because something can be explained lore wise doesn't mean it's automatically a smart story decision. Throughout this video I've analysed and gone over many instances in the series where I feel Scott Cawthon lacks some confidence in his own story. It's riddled with plot holes and clues that lead absolutely nowhere and it's sad because FNAF's story really does have the potential to have a satisfying ending I find. Scott can deliver on this front, with the Silver Eyes and the original trilogy of games for that matter. The original trilogy was tight, concise and surprisingly straightforward compared to how polarizing and insane the FNAF story is nowadays. And I haven't even mentioned stupid additions like Remnant 
fans guild or whatever until now. Still, this does at least give me hope for the upcoming FNAF film. Considering Scott has worked through multiple scripts trying to produce the best film narrative-wise, I imagine, I really hope Scott chose to not bog down the film with the unnecessary baggage of the games, and instead create a fresh take on the series and tell an original story similar to the Silver Eyes. Which sadly, the games also had the perfect opportunity to do as well with Security Breach, but of course we need to tie it into the pre-existing lore and overextend things again. Just think, imagine if Security Breach was a reboot, yes, a reboot, without any of the baggage whatsoever. Imagine like a Goonies inspired horror exploration game with a awesome 1983's Chuck E. Cheese aesthetic that is more honest about its targeted audience, bursting with the personality that Security Breach already possesses, an original mystery, an actual good game structure with little to no glaring glitches and terrible optimization. Optimization. I can't say that word. I think Security Breach really could have been something special. The good news is, is that the upcoming film has the same opportunity and I'm more optimistic about it. I didn't make this video because I hate the series, it's the opposite. I want to see it learn from its mistakes and be the best it can be. Ah, finally done. Finally finished editing together my FNAF video on the 2DS. Ah, uh, Wallace. Oh, what? What is it? What's this? I think you'll want to see this. Oh no. What if I told you that everything we thought we knew about SNAP was a lie? That Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy were never possessed. That the bite of 87 never happened. Heck, that the bite of 83 never happened. What if I told you that William Afton didn't die because some spirit harassed him in a back room, but because he got careless? Well, what if I told you that Golden Freddy never existed? You would all think that I was crazy, right? That after 60 episodes covering the series that I'd finally lost it, or gotten so desperate that I needed you to throw it all away and start again for content. But I assure you, I'm still here. Totally sane, or yes, as sane as I've ever been, and totally suspecting that some, maybe even all of the statements that I just made are a hundred percent true. So open your ears and listen to what I have to say, because once I'm done, none of us will have this franchise the same way again. No, it can't be. No, Wallace. It's time I tell you about Steve Fury.